Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Automating and Securing Your Zero Trust Data Center. My name is Stephanie Rulo, Product Marketing Manager here at Juniper Networks, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Today I'm joined by Crystal Porter Carrero and John Ng. Crystal Porter Carrero is currently the Product Line Manager for Advanced Threat at Juniper Networks. She has also spent time in the field as a system engineer for Juniper, specializing in security solutions for the US federal government. Prior to that, she was the vice president at Training Experts, which provides instructors and content developers for a variety of tech companies, including Juniper Networks and Microsoft. Crystal leverages her technical and customer-centric background to guide Juniper's product and services in the quickly evolving field of automated threat prevention and workload protection. John Ng is currently the Product Marketing Director for the Juniper Networks Data Center Portfolio. Prior to Juniper, he was Director of Product Management and Business Development for the Cisco Data Center Business Unit focused on intent-based network and security solutions for over 25 years. John has led engineering teams in developing security-based IoT devices and holds five U.S. patents in the areas of network management. As Crystal and John go through the presentation today, please feel free to enter questions in the chat box. They will answer your questions immediately following the presentation. So without further ado, let me th hand things over to Crystal and John. Thank you, Stephanie. So today what we're gonna be talking about is um, automating and securing your zero trust data center. And you know, first we want to go over um, some of the trends, some of the things that's been happening in the network world and how networks have evolved for the over the past decade and it will continue to do so. There's been massive amount of data that's going into the data center and into the network itself that requires additional new methods of managing this huge amount of data you know, from your IoT devices, from your web applications, through applications on your mobile phone even. All this information is coming in and we need a better way to manage it. And it's also the better way of securing it as well. And one of the things that we also have been seeing is that data is no longer center in one place, no longer in one place inside the data center. It's happening at the edge where critical data and infrastructures are, are residing there. Uh, with this, security also have to change in a distributed manner as well. And then with the emerging trend of going everything to the cloud, it's forcing customers to evaluate their long-term uh, security solution and how to best spend their budget to secure all of their data. So, you know, one of the things about security inside the network and the data center itself is, you know, these are the things that's been happening, you know, recently, you know, we hear about the colonial pipeline with all the ransomware that's been happening there. Uh, stopping the you know gas pipes. You know, and additional to that is you know you also hear about the JPS meat supplier, uh, you know affecting the supply chain uh, that's keeping uh, you know the production of uh, of produce as well. So these are things that you hear about now, but it's been actually happening for quite some time. In fact, you know there's been a lot of uh, data that's been analyzed on this, and if you take a look at it. You know, there's attacks in every 39 seconds, you know, and, uh, you know, just overwhelming the uh, operators in the data center, as well as, you know, people who's managing the network. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, there's breaches, you know, inside the network himself. And a lot of time is, you know, they don't see it for months at a time. As, in fact, it's like 56% of the time, that's where the data is coming from, saying that, you know, these breaches, we don't actually see it for months and even longer. Yeah, and what's kind of interesting about all of this is not only you know how the security landscape has changed, but nowadays you no longer really need to be a sophisticated hacker um, to be able to cause a lot of damage. A lot of what's available now to you know anybody out there, um, you know, with a credit card and a, and motivation. Is the ability to go, you know, buy ransomware as a service or buy DDoS as a service, um, and so all you really need is like, again the motivation and a credit card and maybe access, you know, to the dark web at most, and um, to get these things. And the the Colonial Pipeline um, incident specifically was kind of interesting in that the um, service itself, right, the, the kind of group behind 
the malware as a service that was used in this attack really never meant for it to go that far. They didn't intend for somebody to use it in such a way. And it actually brought more heat on them than they themselves wanted. And so some of, we see even kind of on the, the you know, kind of bad guy side um, and the attacker side that some of them are even starting to put some guardrails around what their applications can do because they can't easily get out of control. That's right. And because of those reasons, you know, and it's funny, you know, how that ransomware is actually a business, you know, um, there's a lot of different ways and trends of delivering service now. Previously, uh, a lot of things were happening on-prem where, you know, everything resides in the data center itself with the infrastructures in a monolithic kind of architecture. Um, but now there's been a trend that's moving to the public cloud where you know all these cloud plays, uh, applications, you know, service, uh, software as a service, um, you know, all these SaaS models and workload migration out into the public cloud, and really this um, provides a lot of the startup companies the ability to react faster to the, uh, deliver uh, service quickly uh, for consumption. Um, and as things move on, the life cycle of the product, we're also seeing a trend that not only are they using with public cloud, but there's been a trend of using a hybrid cloud where not only public cloud, but also on-prem as well. So knowing exactly when your application, what type of life cycle your application's at, um, it you, utilizes you know, either on-prem or into the cloud itself. And this really gives you the you know, simplicity and, and the flexibility of having applications residing because of uh, governance rules of security, of the data just can't be out there into the cloud or as you need it, burst into the cloud itself. And when you look at some of these shifts and how they are driving, you know, security on the other end is all of these cloud applications have really become you know, fairly fundamental to normal business operations. You know, I think most people that are working from home would be hard pressed to do their jobs without access to them, you know, and delivering webinars or, you know, having, um, you know, normal just meetings over Zoom or Teams or whatever application you have to use for that. And so when you kind of move from that, you know, on-prem model to a cloud model, or even a hybrid cloud, you kind of go from having these, you know, data centers um, to these less centralized services, right? And having distributed services. And so you go from having things like, you know, big iron say, and a single data center in, in the sense of like a, you know, big firewall and SRX, you know, 5,800 is one example could be one of those that provides different types of services. It could be a proxy, it could be a VPN, right? It can do IPS and all of these different services, but you go from needing kind of one large one at a single or a few different sites to hundreds or thousands of distributed sites. And with that kind of distributed edge means that there's also now a much larger attack surface. And then you couple that with a shared security model, because whether you are hosting, say, some equipment in a, in a colo, or you actually are hosting your entire application in someone else's, right? cloud, AWS or Google or Microsoft's, right? All of those things have a shared security model. And so there's certain things that you, right, as the as the kind of leasey of say, almost that space um, is responsible for, including security as well as, you know, who the cloud provider and what they're responsible for. And at the end of the day, the security Wherever, you know, kind of wherever the, the data itself is, it's really predicated around protecting that data, but the data is no longer central. So that becomes a much more difficult job. And so when you think about, you know, the same kind of things, I think that happen on the infrastructure side. So as you're starting to automate and move faster, you know, these repeatable um, and automatable things are great, but they have an inherent issue and that one issue, right? One mistake can get amplified. That's correct, you know? So really what you're saying is if you, because of the distributed nature and not only in one place anymore, if you, let's say, roll out a policy that's incorrect in one place and it got distributed, something that really takes like five minutes to do and that's great, you did it in five minutes, but it's gonna take you like five days just to recover that and fix it and test it and make sure everything is uh, fine again. 
Yeah, exactly. You know, it could be something as simple as using an automated script to push out a number of ACLs, right, to a bunch of switches. And if there's one mistake in it, that could mean it could take a couple of days for anybody to even notice and for the wrong traffic to be blocked. And then you have to go back and roll back those changes. There needs to be maintenance windows sometimes to make those changes. So it can create a lot of havoc just from one simple mistake that was made. And then as you start to get more um, uh, advanced security features and, you know, thousands of automated processes, just, you know, kind of can think about how that could possibly like, you know, as it goes, as more and more things move to production, what the kind of a cascade effect of that is. Wow. That's interesting. Can you go over, you know, a little bit more of the landscape then, you know, in terms of all the different aspects of it, of a zero yeah. data center? Yeah, so <clears throat> that's kind of what the Zero Trust Data Center is about. Is we know that every customer is going to have their own configuration as far as what the data center actually is, whether that's something on-prem, whether it's public cloud, somewhere in between. But, you know, what you're really trying to look at is you have users and devices, and then you have applications living in your data center, and you have all of this data, right, that needs to kind of connect and you want to make sure that your users can actually access those applications. And so you kind of have these key checkpoints along the way from user and device all the way to the application itself. And so the first checkpoint may be your DC WAN gateway. That's kind of the entry point to the data center. Your users and devices, you know, you need to make sure they have the correct access that traffic can get in and out, and there's no malware or exploits kind of sneaking in. And then you can move kind of towards the DC uh, interconnect, which is kind of the passageway between right all of your different data centers that often has high volumes of traffic that still need to be protected, right? Because the whole idea behind zero trust is that nothing is trusted by default anymore. Just because it was, you know, kind of made it past the perimeter doesn't mean you can trust that traffic and you still need to be able to get some visibility into it. And again, make sure that there's nothing, you know, once if an attacker does make it past that initial gateway, that they're not able to kind of move laterally within your data center or even between your data centers. And when you get to kind of the intra DC, so that's within the data center looking mostly at kind of east-west traffic, and you wanna make sure that the communications between the groups of services and the applications within them, right, are all protected. And then the last piece, um, is really kind of what we're going to focus a little bit more on later on as we get into this, is talking about cloud workload protection. Because you can have firewalls all the way down to the container level. Um, but if you think about, you know, kind of these different checkpoints and maybe relating them back to physical security, you know, if you're going onto, say, uh, a campus, you might have, you know, a guard stationed at the very front that checks your ID to make sure you're, sure you're supposed to be there. And that's, you know, the very, um, that's your, that's your, you know, DC way gateway, for instance. And then there may be multiple buildings and to get into any one of those buildings, you know, you can kind of walk between them, check them out a little bit, but to get into any one of them, again, you have to badge in. So you have, you know, some passageways in between being checked every once in a while. And then before you go into the building, you need to have, again, yourself badged in. The intra DC, you know, you can almost think of as you're trying to go between the floors in that building. Again, to you know, push floor seven or floor eight, you have to get put your badge in, and you have to be able to, you know, have permission to even go there. And then you get down to come on, you know, kind of the container level, and you might even have like a containerized firewall that's a guard up front of the door to that specific room. But once you're in the room, there's nothing else there. And you can kind of think of, of like cloud workload protection there is once you get past that guard post in front of the room, what happens if the room itself is breached? You know, can anybody just then do whatever they want in there? Is there a window in the back that is easily to, you know, get out of uh, or exfiltrate data from there? And so cloud workload protection kind of is there to add that last bit of visibility and protection for the data center itself. Because there's lots of places and locations and your applications and users that all have to connect into the data center. And business continuity is, is really extremely important. And downtime for any reason can be costly. And so downtime can be 
because there's some threat that gets in, whether it's a known threat or a unknown threat, you want to make sure that has, you know, kind of minimal false positives. You want to make sure you have consistent security policies so your users are able to access the right types of information. And then, of course, you need reliable network connectivity on top of all of this, because right? that downtime can be caused by any one of those three factors. Um, and ensuring that you know you have a quality user experience and continued access to those resources that are often kind of the crown jewels of your business. You now you're going to make sure that that sensitive data and those business critical applications are available, but also secure. That's, you know, Crystal, wow, that's a lot of information. That's fantastic. Because for me, you know, I always thought that, you know, uh, security in data center or using my applications really two things is one is about encryption. As long as my data is encrypted, I thought I'm good. And then the uh, second thing is, you know, um, once I get into the data center, I thought everything it's, it's you know, it's well protected because I, the, the packet arrive inside the data center, but it seems like there's a, a lot more to it. Yeah, especially nowadays, where you know there's so many different types of threats. There's um, different ways to move laterally once you've kind of gotten that initial beachhead into a network, and then of course there's you know I mean you can read about all the data breaches that happen all the time, and a lot of times you know the attacker may not be going for a specific resource, but just trying to get data outside. Yeah, wow, that's fantastic. So you know. Additionally to this, you know, securing your data center, you know, uh, one thing I do know is talking to a lot of customers, talking to a lot of people out there and operators, uh, what they're really seeking is, you know, a new approach to um, securing their data center, you know, just automating and, and making sure that things are working correctly. Well, some of the common themes that they're looking for is like security, reliability, and agility. And I know those are kind of like these big buzzwords, you know, but what does that actually mean? Um, and, you know, and what I'm seeing is, you know, uh, what they're looking for is uh, ability to automate and create a re uh, repeatable success. Mm -hmm. That means, you know, instead of just typing everything in because everything's distributed and there's multiple switches in your data center and a lot of different, um, uh, you know, different configuration that's required, like policies and such, is oftentimes it's easy to make mistakes. And like what we talked about earlier, Something that takes you five seconds to do, it will take you like several days, five days, just to you know undo something, you know, uh, to roll back some of the policies. And this is where you know the AppStore solution really kind of comes in and is very helpful. Uh, it provides the ability to take a look at policies that you're um, trying to roll out and identifying if there's any clash in those policies, like access lists, and knowing that. Uh, you know, if there's a conflict in intent, you know, if one is overriding the other, now which one's actually correct? You know, Abstract has a, a way of going about analyzing that and telling you that, hey, you might be potentially having a security hole there. Uh, or the fact that you want to go to this next generation fabric um, uh, architecture with VX90 VPN, with all the uh, goodness of the segmentation, you love all those goodness, but it's hard to provision something like that. And you know, how do you go about making it easy for yourself? And that's where AppStore also kind of comes in, allowing you to configure uh, the segmentations, you know, the uh, spines and the leaves and just roll out a v, uh, VX90 VPN fabric, you know, uh, correctly uh, and being able to, you know, reproduce that again and again. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, there's a lot of, um, it, it makes it a whole lot easier when you start to automate, but there's a lot of things to take, keep in mind that as you start automating things, are you automating the correct things? Are you automate, automating it in the correct way? Um, and so having the security piece baked in, having some intent-based you know, lifecycle management in there can be really helpful to make sure that these things get done and kind of get done correctly because it's easy to make mistakes and have those magnified. Yes, absolutely. But I'd like to hear more about this workload protection that you know you're talking about. So, if you could walk us through it, that would be fantastic. Yeah. So Juniper Cloud workload protection, and I think before we go into what the you know product really is, I want to talk a little bit more about just applications and application security because nearly everything we do on the network involves application, whether that's again sitting in in a webinar, browsing the web 
you know, chatting with friends, using mobile games, or even just normal business kind of applications that you use on a day-to-day -day basis, they're what allows us to kind of live our digital lives and they connect us with one another. Um, but those applications do have to store, process, and exchange data. And when we use them, we expect them, one, to be accessible immediately. I mean, how many times have you picked up your phone and gone to, you know, order food, say, for instance, or, you know, call a car or any other thing, and even just browse the website, and it doesn't come up, you know, within 10 seconds. You're probably just like, why is this taking so long? Everybody wants access to everything immediately. And you also kind of just trust that the application is doing what it's intended to do and that the experience itself is secure. You know, you might see a little lock icon that says, okay, I know that that means something like that's secure. But I think more people are starting to question whether or not their apps are secure because of the number of breaches that are seen. And, you know, I think the, the public is becoming more aware. I mean, just the other day there was, um, you know, in the news, the... the T-Mobile. Uh, T-Mobile, yep, there we go, breach. It's a lot of customer records and a lot of information that gets out there. And so people want to make sure now that their applications are more secure and it helps as a company right, to ensure the security is there. And so that's one of the things we want to help you know, our customers really with is making sure that the application security is a core tenant of their business, but also of the kind of Juniper experience first um, networking philosophy. Because again, going back to you know what an application is at its core, it's code, right? That's written by somebody, and it can contain errors. Not because anybody's doing something malicious or is lazy. It's just errors happen, um, and those errors can present opportunities for attackers to exploit the you know, kind of underlying resources, whether that's the underlying, uh, say, operating system, a database, a data collector. And going back to kind of the amplification issue, just like as you're creating kind of automation and things and say your infrastructure, the same kind of thing can happen with your code. So you might have had a single application running on a single VM with this kind of monolithic structure. And one error at least could be mitigated in a number of ways. Um, and it's only on that specific application within that specific you know, server. But nowadays, if you look at, you know, microservices architectures and the ability to elastically scale, that error, again, creates a huge amplification and where it was an error in one place, it's now an error in 20 containers or 50 containers because you just had a giant burst of traffic. Um, nothing is really perfect, again, so it's really important uh, to, to really look at, you know, the security of these applications. You know, Crystal, this resonates extremely well for me because having come from development, you know, I know that there's no perfect code out there. And as much as we test it, you know, there's still things that escapes us and gets out there and is vulnerable. So. Yeah. And, you know, and I think that's that's just a human, right? It's just a human condition sometimes. Mm. Uh, you know, because everybody wants to get to, you know, market faster. They want to have you know, more um, dialogue with their customers, create better, more innovative solutions. And so there's a lot of reasons why companies are looking at, you know, kind of digital transformation. Uh, but a lot of organizations are starting to almost run before they can walk. And you need to deliver services quickly, but the risk of doing this insecurely is growing. And if you look, you know, at that 48% there, organizations report they regularly push code to production knowing that there are vulnerabilities yeah wow. and it's because yeah and it's, it's because there is um you know time to market and business needs that often come before the security side of things and of course it depends on the severity of the vulnerability found if right before this code is getting ready to be pushed you know from say um pre-prod to production and there's a cve with you know a, a 10 there well, we're probably going to stop everything, go back and fix that first because it's extremely severe and the risk associated with it is really high. But there's also a lot of good reasons not to fix every vulnerability at the time of release. 
right? 48% is it because there's a ton of lazy developers or there's a bunch of bad security analysts that don't find the things in time and give the developers enough time, right? It's really that, you know, you might have say a legacy application that you're gonna sunset soon anyway. So does it make sense to spend a whole month fixing code that you're going to uh, end of life in three months? You might have third party code that you can't fix yourself. You're waiting on the vendor, right? To give you a patch. And then going into whole upgrades and patching, that can be really time consuming. Uh, and so it's something that is being planned, but it might take a little bit longer than you need to get this one specific feature on now that the code is done. So again, it's you know just keeping things in perspective of why these things happen, but that 48% still does exist. Yeah, <clears throat> and you know, the thing is, uh, Crystal, you know, there's also feasibility as well. You know, being a developer, there's oftentimes, you know, there might be code out there that's like 1.1 code, but we have moved on and we're working on 1.2 code. It's really hard for the whole team to stop whatever they're doing just to go back and fix a particular problem, uh, you know, because the code base have changed and it's just not feasible. It's very difficult. Um, so definitely, you know, um, I wish we had, you know, a tool like this, you know, <laughs> that you're talking about that could scan and identify these problems. Yeah, because I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of this comes down to being about trade-offs. And, and as your organization starts to shift, right, and develop, you know, say like DevOps models and more automation and more security or even DevOps, you know, DevSecOps, uh, it's important to have, you know, tools that help you kind of get there. And so you want to make sure that, you know, you're looking at something like Juniper Cloud Workload Protection, which does provide vulnerability detection, but it also does real-time detection and it does it all in one platform. So it can address both the new and unseen vulnerabilities, but also gives you a way to, sh in, you know, kind of ensure that those vulnerabilities are covered in real time in the case that you can't fix them immediately, right? And it does all of this in a signatureless, lightweight manner that's highly scalable. Or highly scalable. There you go. Um, it also uses this thing called optimized flow control integrity technology, which kind of creates a DNA map of your application, which helps you know kind of map out how it should be behaving, and when it does something out of the norm, right? Can look for those type of things. It also helps reduce false positives by validating the execution of the application itself. So you take all of that, both real-time, you know, application production protection for your production network, as well as some vulnerability detection for your pro, you know, pre-production network. And wow. then of course, yeah, take all of that and provide a lot of comprehensive telemetry. So your DevSecOps teams actually can gain insight to the threat activity that's happening. Um, on a per, you know, kind of event uh, basis, but then also get a lot of, you know, rich reporting and roll-ups of, you know, how this happened over a day, a week, a month, including things like application connectivity, topology, and then, of course, detailed information about the attempted attack. And that piece of the, the telemetry you get, like where the attack came from, who was trying to, you know, infiltrate your network, for instance, that information can actually be not only detected and stopped in real time, but then we can take that and share that back with the rest of the network. And through that, you can start to share a feed with the rest of, say, your VSRXs or SRXs and all those different checkpoints we kind of talked about. So you kind of detect it once at the application level, but then enforce it everywhere along the way within your data center. So you're not wasting resources over and over trying to stop the same, say, attacker, or that attacker may have tried to um, run the same type of uh, exploit against maybe five or 10 different services within your network. And now you can kind of block them all. And if they try to move laterally again, that information, right, that, that, that stopped automatically. Wow, that's fantastic. So what I'm hearing is, in summary, is like the Juniper workload protection helps you stop attacks in real time in running application that's inside your data center today. Um, you know, without any changes to code, it just identifies it with using his uh, telemetry data, using his algorithm, figuring out that attack is coming in and stop it right then and there. Yeah, exactly. 
you know, it can do things like monitor the behavior of your containers. It can scan them for vulnerability. It can also do segmentation and kind of secure the mesh further or secure mesh to further improve your security. And again, while I would love to say that we will 100% protect you against every attack, there's no silver bullet, unfortunately, in security. And so some things may get through. And so in the case of a breach, it's always important to also kind of reduce the blast radius of that attack and make sure the rest of the network right, is aware of what's happening. And so the more information you can share, especially in an automated, scalable fashion, I think the better. Okay, and this is signatureless, right? So you you have a, you don't need to have seen this problem before because most of the tools that I've used is you know it scans a signature, it sees it first. Uh, you know somebody has to feed it to me, uh, but this is something different. Correct. Yep. And so while it can protect you against a lot of known attacks, there's also you know some behavior detection, so it can do this all without any signatures, which can one. Be, you know, take time because you have to know about something to protect against it first. And then secondly, the, you know, agents that are running at the application level can get fairly bloated when you have to constantly load new signatures. And that's just another bit of operational overhead. Fantastic. So yes. I'd like to see more about it. All right. So now I'm going to go ahead here and I'm going to. Hello and welcome to today's Juniper Cloud Workload Protection Demonstration. We'll show you how together the VSRX and Juniper Cloud Workload Protection can protect the workload. Let's take a look at our setup. Here we have a normal application user and an attacker. Both will use the two windows that will appear on the left-hand side of the screen. A typical user will request the website and the attacker sends some routine curve requests for at least one attack. We will also see the VSRX UI on the left and the firewall itself shows the dynamic of the IP big blocks. On the right, we will have the Juniper Cloud Workload Protection UI so we can see the traffic coming into the firewall. We will start with some normal traffic, and there are two users, our typical user and the attacker from the slide I showed you just a second ago. As you can see, it's the TCP and normal applications, and we can see some closed access from the internet to the server and that's a policy name. You will notice here that we don't have any activity displayed. Let's launch an attack. Of course, we will not show you the code for that attack. As you can see, we have a warning. I'll go ahead and refresh. We have the remote code execution launch on this web server. As you can see, it was blocked as expected. We have the full detail of the incident. On the incident detail tab, we can see the customer ID, message, severity level, incident ID, trace, and validation timestamp. Next, let's take a look at the identifier tab. This tab shows which application is affected and where it is running. Here we can see the container IP, the container name, the container ID, the time the incident started, the image ID, the node name and ID, and we can see even more detail. Next, let's look at the attack detail tab. Here we have the attack details, even the line number where the incident has occurred, and we can see in the additional tabs the trace of the application, and we can see additional information about the attack. Here, you can see our attacker's IP address, which will now be blocked, and we also have the command used to execute the attack. Now, Juniper Cloud Workload Protection takes that address, and when the attacker tries to perform a standard request, he will not be granted access the request will be automatically blocked. Here we can see that the session has been denied and we are matching the policy with Juniper Cloud Workload Protection. These fields speak automatically to each other and will block the attacker permanently on any other website behind this firewall. Of course, that can also apply to other firewalls on the network communicating with Juniper Cloud Workload Protection.
Additionally, we can dig into more details on Juniper Cloud workload protection, such as where the vulnerabilities are on a server, whether these vulnerabilities are critical or not, and what other applications are running on the server. When we double click and go into more detail, we can see whether the application is vulnerable and other related information. We also have visibility into both active containers running as well as past containers. We can see information including behaviors and vulnerabilities in both detail and summary form. We have a daily activity report that helps you compare attacks and has all the information related to vulnerabilities and attacks on your network at your fingertips. Going back to our attacker, we can see through the integration between the VSRX and Juniper Cloud workload protection that they are still blocked. We can see this attack on the firewall logs and all future requests will be permanently blocked. Thank you for joining me for this demonstration of Juniper Cloud workload protection. Wow, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, so now all I want to do was spend a little, just a little bit of time here kind of drilling down a little bit more to what kind of, you know, we saw um, in that quick demonstration. One of the things is being able to get, you know, attack um, details that can be used not only again for kind of some of the real time protections and then also, you know, pushing, um, you know, providing that threat detection and auto remediation is really important because if you think about, you know, all of these different groups that now at least have security on their mind and security is, is sometimes their main right, point of their job, things like this security and operations have to deal with that attack as it's happening often while waiting for, say, your developers and the DevOps team to actually resolve the issue at its core. And so having, you know, the ability to automatically find the threats, remediate them, share that threat telemetry with the rest of the network by extending it to the SRX, thus so you can stop the threats at all those various checkpoints within your data center, plus getting all of the detailed attack level information that you need to kind of pass on to your developers down to the line of code where that vulnerability might exist, things like stack traces, right? All of those things where they can really use that to kind of close the gap and harden the application itself so that these no longer have to be mitigated on the network, but are closed once and for all is really important. And again, having that all in one place makes it so much easier for all these teams to work together. You also get things like proof of exploits. So, you know, you might have, um, you know, I've worked on the, the security side before um, and with a number of security teams, you might have an analyst that, you know, is in charge of doing application security. And part of what they might do is go through and run, say, you know, a vulnerability scanner and get a list of here's all the things that you're vulnerable to. Well, then as the developer, <laughs> you might have you know gone through this where you're going through and going, well, this really isn't an actual thing we're vulnerable to because we've done something else that kind of alleviates that issue. Or yeah, we're already fixing that. And it's this kind of back and forth that creates some kind of you know friction points. Mm -hmm. And so having a consolidated, you know, kind of view where analysts, um, your security operations teams and your developers and DevOps people can all kind of work together in and provide metrics that are needed to prevent those future attacks helps kind of elevate the team and they can use these as an educational tool as well. So you can share information and find those potential issues before they arise. Because now it's not just, here's a list of things that you're vulnerable to, please go fix them. It's, hey, we were able to find this vulnerability. And it's not just something that we think you might be vulnerable to based off of the scan or based off of some pen testing we had done. But this is something that was exploited. And we can even right, provide how it was exploited. 
right? So what was the type of exploit? In this case, you can see it was remote. It was a remote code execution. And you could even get the payload that was used in this particular exploit. Now, there may be other payloads that, be, you know, that could be used to generate a similar type of attack. But here's at least one example and a proof of that exploit. Again, so it's really, um, I think, an it extremely helpful tool um, to use, you know, for everybody to help educate and, and start to relieve some of those friction points between all these different groups that are involved often. Yeah, Crystal, you know, <clears throat> the more I hear you talk, the more I wish that there was this tool when I was in development, because I could just take a look at this, pinpoint exactly where the problem is, how to trigger the problem, how to create new regression testing to make sure that these kind of uh, uh, problems don't escape, you know, uh, development because this would be extremely helpful. So, you know, all in all, it's like it, this tool is not only used for developer, but for operators as well to stop some of these attacks where they're responsible for the operation of the services inside the data center, as well as educational tool uh, of, for the developers as well. Yeah, exactly. And then also having the ability to look at say both active and past vulnerabilities Mm -hmm. Especially when you look at, like, say, containers, they're ephemeral in nature. They're not, you know, always sitting there and you don't have time, especially as a security analyst. If the container, you know, say, was spun up for five minutes and then it was no longer needed, well, how do you do analysis on that? And so there's, you know, tools out there and there's obviously ways to do it, but it becomes kind of cumbersome. Mm -hmm. So what if you had, again, the same types of information for not only active containers, but also the past containers, and you can see where those vulnerabilities lie. Maybe there are some, you know, some correlation you can get between those. And again, it's about figuring out where those vulnerabilities might exist mm -hmm. and hardening the application so you're no longer relying on, you know, all of these additional kind of bolt-on tools. Mm -hmm. Why those are good as kind of stopgap mechanisms, relying just on those um, isn't, you know, is helpful to a point, but if it was, you know, the best way of doing it, we might not see as many <laughs> attacks and, and, you know, um, data breaches as we do today. Yeah, I really like this uh, visibility, the metrics that you're talking about, and, you know, just being able to categorize the type of attacks and then knowing exactly, specifically, even down to the line that they're attacking, they're using to attack. So exactly. this is fantastic. Exactly. And, you know, I think that's that's one of the last things here I'll talk about is just you now the world is changing and, you know, that can be difficult sometimes as you have these three different groups who all have different directives. Um, it's not that anybody's mean or lazy or obnoxious or <laughs> all these other words you could put to it. I'm sure mm -hmm. if you've worked in any of these areas, you might have felt about you know other teams in your organization. A lot of organizations are struggling with this and how do they kind of fix the security vulnerabilities and the kind of inherent nature of these things? Um, because it's, you know, there's operations, there's the technology side, and we're becoming more efficient there, but the security and our security posture is starting to lag a little bit behind. And so we want to, you know, be able to detect and deny access where it makes sense because your network team, right, is mostly focused on providing uptime and availability, right? That's the metrics that are often judged by where security is really looking at needing visibility, doing forensics, finding threats, protecting users and devices and applications and data. They have a lot of things they have to protect um, and provide information on. And then, of course, you look at your developers where they're developing new features, new products, new and innovative ways, innovative ways to solve problems and, you know, kind of forcing, say, your developer to be a security analyst or your security analyst to learn how to, you know, be a developer. Um, it can work in some organizations, but it may not always be the right answer. And it can be very challenging for those individual people. Uh, and so one of the things, you know, I, I've talked to a number of customers and, and trying to get a sense of, you know, how are they trying to solve this issue? Because if you look at the um, the cost, right, and benefit the cost analysis here, finding these security vulnerabilities early in the development process, you know, cost about $80 as opposed to 
you know, about $7,600 uh, when you find it after it's been moved to production. So there's some very obvious cost savings, but there's also just a savings in, you know, trying to make everybody's life a little bit easier where you don't have to make as you know many compromises. You're not spending as many hours just kind of chasing problems that you kind of already knew were there, but now had to track them down and alleviate them. So it's, it's getting rid of some of those friction points um, that are often put in there because the business needs to be more agile. And security is sometimes seen as a department of no. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've talked to, um, like for example, one customer one of the ways they were trying to help solve this issue, at least in an organizational way, was take all of their security team and place them under the CTO. So that your security team kind of sits alongside your developers and everybody rolls up to the same person at the end of the day in the organization. I've talked to another customer who was doing the exact opposite uh, and they were moving their development team under the CISO. And saying now, you know, all of these teams have to work together and it's the system's job to make sure that the applications are secure. And so they're being given some developers to work with on their team to ensure that this happens. Um, and why, you know, I don't think that we have the answers for the organizational challenges that can arise, making right. sure that you're leveraging technologies that improve everybody's, you know, um, day to day life, I think can be really helpful and giving the visibility and, and trying to use it kind of as an educational tool so everybody can work together more efficiently and more effectively is yeah. really important. You know, just looking at this slide is really uh, astounding, you know, just seeing that if you fix it upstream, you know, closest to development, it costs $80, and then you fix it downstream with all the up, all the, you know, upgrades that you have to do for, uh, you know, fixing a, a, a image, a problem, you know, as the software, and then having to have this maintenance window, it could cost up to $7,600. I mean, those those numbers are just, wow, this huge. And, you know, just overall, just listening to everything you have said, Crystal, I mean, I'm just like really excited about this because I could see any CXO level type of person seeing that, hey, uh, you know, uh, our operation team is capable of stopping attacks even when there is some minor vulnerabilities that's out there that people could exploit and try to get into our data center. And now you have this workload protection that's really allows me to sleep better at night. I mean, earlier we talked about Appstra being providing you with the automation, the ability to detect when when you make mistakes, you know, manually. Uh, and also if you have some uh, clashes in intent when you're adding access lists that could potentially open holes. But this is just another, you know, tool in the toolbox that could, you know, address these vulnerability attacks that, uh, you know, people could come in and exploit our, um, you know, disrupt our service and exploit our data center. Exactly. You know, it's, it's a difficult um, challenge, but I think there's a number of ways that, you know, we can try to help our customers solve these issues um, through automation, through, you know, having more reliable processes through adding security and baking those into everything kind of at its core and sharing that threat data, not only with the network, but with each other right? and all the different teams kind of involved in this. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So, so I was just going to take a quick look here. It looks like we have a couple questions. So I'm going to answer a couple questions here just, just briefly. And then uh, for any ones that I don't get to, I apologize. We are running kind of short on time here. So, you know, please reach out uh, to your, you know, either Juniper account team. You can reach out to, to John and I. We'd be more than happy to help as well uh, if we don't get to your question. So I'm just going to take a look here at a couple of them. So one of the questions is Juniper Cloud Workload Protection on premers in the cloud. Um, and I, think, I don't know if that's something that we actually address. So there is, it's a SaaS Right, base offering. So it's a kind of a cloud based offering where it makes it really easy so that you don't have to deploy anything except for the agents and you can get access to kind of everything it has to offer. But there is also an on prem option for those customers that would prefer that. So you have, you know, both options. Most people go with the SaaS option because it's easier. You don't have to worry about, you know, the kind of operational overhead and having to run a server and some additional resources for it. But it does come as an on prem. Um, offering if you need it. One of the other questions here, let's see. Can the attack also be flagged once it's already inside the data center? So that's a great question. Um, and so yeah, that's one of the things, right, is is when and 
uh, when a vulnerability right is being exploited by an active attacker, that's one of the things you'll see kind of right. There's an active notification that'll pop up as it's stopping that. You'll get all of the threat detail you need. But the other thing, right, is not only flagging and saying, hey, it's here, but we're stopping it in real time. And then we're also sharing information about the attacker, right, who's trying to ex ex exploit the application itself and sharing that information with the rest of the network. So that goes onto the feed that gets shared out with, say, the VSRX or your physical SRXs. So you can kind of detect it on one application and actually protect all of your applications and really everything within your data center. So at the you know, can the container level to the VM level up to the, you know, intra DC level and between your data centers and all the way to the perimeter, all of that is shared um, with the the help of right, the, the threat protection, the cloud application workload protection platform and the SRX integration. Um, and I think, you know, again, if there's other questions, please feel free to reach out. And um, I thank you guys, you know, all so much for coming and hanging out with John and I tonight. And thank yeah. you, John, for all your insight. Yeah, and thank you, you know, for sharing this workload protection, Juniper uh, Cloud Workload Protection, I think is an awesome application and just another tool, you know, that could help us. So thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, John and Crystal. Um, I know I really enjoyed this conversation. I think it was really interesting to kind of hear both of your insight on this topic. Um, and I want to thank everybody for joining us for today's webinar, um, Automating and Securing Your Zero Trust Data Center. Um, if you would like to view this webinar again or share it with a colleague, we will have the recording up on Bright Talk um, for on-demand viewing shortly. Um, we hope it was really helpful and um, we hope to see you online with us again soon. So thank you and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.